Okay, uh, with that, um, let me introduce, introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Ruth Carter. Uh, she's a, a lawyer in, from Arizona and uh, also is a model. So she's worked both sides of the camera. Uh, she mentioned that she's not familiar with camera equipment, but uh, she is familiar with the legalities of uh, photography. So that's what she's gonna be talking about tonight. So with that, let me turn it over to Ruth. And again, please, if you haven't muted yourself, please mute yourself. Okay, go ahead, Ruth. All right. Thanks, Mike, Chuck, uh, Cleveland Photograph Society for having me. Always a pleasure to be in Cleveland, even if only virtually. Um, and we have a PowerPoint, so let me share my screen. Oh. Host has disabled participant screen sharing. I have All made right. you a co-host, Ruth, so you should be able to share your screen now. There you yes. go. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. This is my screen. You may look at it. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about the questions I'm most frequently asked about copyright and contracts, which seems to be the most common issues impacting photographers. So as Mike said, I am a lawyer. Um, I, my practice does focus on photography, among other things, um, business, intellectual property, copyrights, trademarks, and internet law. In my not so spare time, I am a model, um, both actually male, female, and non-binary model because I am non-binary. My pronouns are they, them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I was actually just looking at some images Unmute. Okay, now I'm back. Um, all right. Every time I give it, every time I give a talk, I have to give this disclaimer. I am an attorney. However, until you are paying me, I am not your attorney. I'm here today to provide general legal information, not legal advice. If you need legal advice, go hire somebody. And then I also need to warn you. Uh, that the answer to every legal question starts with, it depends. So I don't say this to be annoying. It's just that every legal situation comes down to the specifics of the situation. So you might hear this phrase a lot tonight. If you want to turn it into a drinking game, feel free. This is water. All right, so let's just jump into it and talk about the basics of copyright. So. To get a copyright, the bar is very, very low. You only need two things, an original work of authorship that's fixed in any tangible medium. I can't remember which one of these is like a bad word in another country. I'm, I might be like squaring online at people. Um, so that means the moment you click your shutter on your camera, you have a copyright in that image. Um, so it can even be, it doesn't even have to be on film. It doesn't have to be a print. It can just be a digital file in your camera. Once you've created that image, you have a copyright in it. And notice there is nothing in this regarding talent or quality. So that means that the beautiful photos that you take are given the same level of protection as the craptastic photos I take with my phone of my dog. So the thankfully, our founding fathers realized very early on, it is not their place to judge what is and is not art or are deserving of copyright. So they just said, if you meet this minimum standard, original work of authorship fixed in any tangible medium, you get a copyright. You don't have to put your name on it. You don't have to register it. You just have to create it. Once it's created, you have those rights. And something to keep in mind about copyright is there is no protection for facts or ideas. Uh, so 
would, in terms of photography, this is why two photographers can have very, very similar photos and there's no copyright infringement. So for example, this photographer took this picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. They own the copyright in this photo. But what they don't have is the exclusive right to how the bridge looks under these circumstances. I could go to San Francisco, figure out where this person was standing, wait for nightfall, fuss with the settings on my camera and to, to try to recreate this image and snap my own photo. Our photos may look nearly identical, but as long as I'm not taking his photo and putting my name on it and claiming it as my own, um, there's no copyright infringement. So this is why it's possible to have two nearly identical photos without any copyright infringement going on. All right, so when you have a copyright, the law gives you five rights. The right to copy, distribute, display, perform, and to make derivative works. Um, I don't know how you perform a picture, but it is granted to you. Um, copy, distribute, display are all pretty self-explanatory. Derivative works are works based on other existing works. So the best way I know to think about derivative works is Star Wars. Um, so if the first Star Wars movie was the original, derivative works of that would be things like the movie posters, action figures, the Yoda backpacks, costumes, um, things like that. Those are all derivative works. And so whoever owns the copyright in the film used to be George Lucas, Industrial Light Magic, now it's Disney. They get to decide what works get to be made. So for photography, it would be you own the photo. If somebody came along and took your image and did their own edits to it without your permission, that would be a derivative. Uh, even with your permission, it would be a derivative work. If they did it without your permission, it would be also infringement. The line between what is a derivative work and what is fair use is very, very fuzzy. So uh, I run into that situation sometimes with people. And the best way I know to think about these copyright rights in general is a jar of markers. Whoever owns the copyright has the five markers for copy, distribute, display, perform derivative works. And the owner gets to decide which markers they're going to use, if they're going to loan certain markers to other people and let them use those rights, um, if they're going to sell certain markers, sell certain rights, or choose not to use them. And if you choose not to use one of the rights granted to you because you're the copyright holder, that doesn't open the door for somebody else to use it. Um, they're like, well, you weren't using it. It's like, yeah, I'm, it's my work. It's my prerogative. So something to keep in mind. I know we run into that a lot with people. Um, so I told you already, you don't have to register your copyright to get your rights. So then why would anybody choose to register the work with the US Copyright Office through copyright.gov? There's really only three situations in which I would recommend that to a client. And that is if they're planning on licensing their work, like they, um, they sell a license for people to use their photos. If you're gonna sell your work, either the copyright itself or prints, or if you're planning to sue. In the US, one of the rules is you cannot sue for copyright infringement unless the work has been registered. So when my clients um, are, get a cease and desist letter uh, regarding a copyright, which one of them actually got this week, um, one of the things I look for in that letter is where is that registration number? Where is that disclosure that this work has been registered that indicates that this person could sue at any moment, so we better get this thing settled. Um, so, and if they don't, then I kind of raise an eyebrow and go, this sounds like a shakedown. This doesn't sound like something that could move forward into a lawsuit anytime soon. So those are the three reasons why somebody might register. Um, if you, if your situation doesn't fall into one of those three, maybe it's not worth the cost and the time to go through the process of registering your work. When you say sell on there, are you talking about selling the photo? Or are you talking about 
selling um, the copyright oh. somehow. I, I'm not quite it's sure. It's either I one. That. If you are selling prints, you want to register your work. If you sell the copyright, you want to register your work because that actually increases the value of your work um, by having it registered because then the person who's purchased it is in the position where if the work is infringed, they could sue. Could you explain licensing a little bit more, please? Licensing is a permission slip. So that means that you still own the copyright, but you're granting someone permission to use it. Um, so I frequently I see that, like, let's say someone wants to take one of your photos and use it on their blog. You might say, okay, um, my lowest price um, license is 250 and that gives you a worldwide royalty free license to use the image for two years and then you have to remove it. Um, you can't sub license it to anybody else. And I think those are pretty much the, the, the main requirements I would expect to see in a license versus if someone wants a perpetual worldwide royalty free license, I would say like, okay, well, then that's going to be $1,000. Um, because the long the more rights you get, um, the more permission you get to use an image, the more you pay. So I hope that explains it a license is basically granting permission for someone to use your work while you still retain the copyright yourself. Thank you. If you do grant a license, I always recommend that you grant a non-exclusive license because if you grant somebody an exclusive license, that means that you lose the ability to use the image yourself because only the person who has the license can use it. So always non-exclusive, unless you use your words, with the exception of few situations, I say grant a non-exclusive license. So. All right, so that's kind of just the basics kind of overview of copyright. Let's jump into what happens if you choose to share your work on social media, which a lot of us do. We know Instagram and Facebook and all these places. I know most people do not read the terms of service of these websites. We just click the box, yes, I agree, without ever reading it. We probably all signed over the rights to our firstborn child. Even though I'd, re even though I'd write these terms of service for a living for some companies, I'm just as guilty um, of not reading them all. But if you share images on social media, so not your own website, so Instagram, Facebook, other places, you may be granting the website a license to use your photo for whatever they want. So suddenly your photo could suddenly be like the, the main feature of their marketing campaign and without giving you any money, without giving you any credit, it's just this cool photo that they're suddenly using. And if you raise your hand and go, yo, dude, ah, pay me, give me credit, do something. They will show you the terms of service and say, "Ah, uh -uh, we don't have to. You agreed that we can use your photo for whatever we want. Thanks. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Um, it's unlikely to happen given what I've seen from these social media campaigns. I haven't seen them pull photos that I thought, oh my God, someone's probably pissed. I haven't seen that happen, but could it happen? Yes. So it's just a good idea to be aware. And on some of these websites, by posting the photo, you're also granting permission for people to at least share your work. So you wanna be just aware of the rules of the site before you post your work on it. All right, let's talk about how do you discover if your work's been stolen? And really I could have written this slide to say when your work's been stolen, because it's not if, it's when your stuff gets stolen. Um, I've had my work stolen at least five times. So and it's just hilarious when people steal from the lawyer, but it happens. So with photos, a lot of people think that they can, you know, use any photo 
they want as long as they give an attribution and a link back to the original. Um, and they'll say, I'm giving you exposure. I'm letting people see your work. I'm, I'm helping you. Why are you upset with this? Um, because they don't understand copyright and that's your decision to make, not theirs in terms of where your work gets distributed. Um, the way I like to think of it is how would this play out in another situation? Because we're really good about understanding the laws about like tangible property much better than the laws of intellectual property. So let's say your neighbor had a really nice vintage car and it's really cool. It's beautiful. You think it's gorgeous. You think everybody should see it. It's sitting outside his house. He's not driving it right now. You're going to take it out and give it exposure. You're going to show it. You're going to share it with the, with the neighborhood. Like, look at this car. Look how great it is. It's, it's Mr. Jones's. Isn't it wonderful? If the cops pull you, well, when the cops pull you over, and you say, I'm giving it exposure. The cops are going to say, no, you're committing grand theft auto. So it's a situation I think a lot of us have run into where people have stolen our work, not realizing that what they did was wrong. Um, and there's even gurus who will tell them that, that as long as you give the attribution and a link, that it is perfectly legal. So you see people who go to the Google machine and pull any image they want and do that. Um, on the flip side, you can also use the Google machine to see if someone's stolen your work. So what you can do is go to the Google Images site, click on that little camera icon, and it'll give you the ability to either um, upload an image or um, put in a URL and it will search the internet for that image. And so that's one way to detect free of, you know, free of charge. No, it doesn't cost you a thing to see if one of your images has been used. Um, the downside of this is if somebody has altered your photo, they've cropped it, they've edited it in some way, it may not pop up because it's no longer an exact match. And that's what the Google machine is looking for. They're looking for an exact match of what you showed it. But this, I have used this to find photos um, that people have used without permission. Another thing you can do is set up a Google alert. Um, specifically on your own name because again people will give that attribution and so if someone especially if you're somebody who has a less than common name I mean I have you know the ultimate old lady name Ruth hasn't been the a most popular name in the U.S. since like 1905 so I have a Google alert on my name so I find out if people are writing about me or if they're quoting me um, or sometimes if they're stealing from me, um, my name will, will, I will get that daily email of, hey, here's a new Ruth Carter. And either it's something about me, a obituary of another Ruth Carter who's died, because again, 1905, um, or there is a Oscar winning costume designer named Ruth Carter. So I get to follow her career, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's something to think about. Again, this is a free, this is another free service. The other thing you can do that is totally free, watch the analytics on your site. Uh, if you have a website where you post your work, you through analytics, whether you use Google Analytics, you use a plugin on your, on your WordPress site, you can see how are people getting to your website. And so when I ever see somebody who has gotten to my site that I don't recognize, I will click on that link to go back and see, oh, how did you manage to get here? Are you, was it from an article that, um, that mentions me? Is it an article about a topic that I've written on and they're linking to me for more information? Um, and every so often it's a situation where someone just stole stuff right off my website, gave that link and an attribution. And the moment someone clicks on that link, it pops up in my analytics. So the five times my work has been stolen, it's because of my analytics that I found out about it. So again, something you can do that's totally free. I know there are services out there that you can pay for that like they, you upload your files and they regularly search the internet for them. I don't know enough about them to be able to speak to any one of them, 
but I do know that they exist. All right. So once you discover that someone's stolen your work, you always want to respond because what you don't want to do is be in a situation where you have established a track record of knowing that people are stealing your work and doing nothing because there will come a time when somebody is stealing your work and you want to lay the smack down on them and so you send that cease and desist or something like that and they respond back with well you let everybody else use your work without permission why should i be treated any differently so that's why i tell people you always want to infringe two situations where you believe your work has been stolen and there's more than one way to do this there's actually five main ways to do this. So the first one is you grant permission after the fact. You reach out to that person and say, hey, I see you like my stuff so much that you put it on your blog. I love that you love my work. Um, in the future, um, you need to ask permission in advance. Um, I'm going to grant you permission for to continue to use it. Um, you know, you may put some caveats on it, like, you know, it's okay if you're using it as long as you don't make money off of it, or you have to add an attribution, you, whatever, your, your photo, your rules. Um, but you grant permission. And I've done this where someone's used my stuff and I've said, yep, it's okay, but next time ask permission. Your next option is the cease and desist letter. And it's basically, it's a letter from you to them or your lawyer to them saying, stop it. This is mine, not yours. Take it down is usually what we see. Um, because in, with cease and desist, oftentimes the photographer just wants the person to stop using their photo um, and that's all they want. So a cease and desist is a way to do it. And you can do what's called a nasty gram and be really mean about it, um, you know, or have the lawyer write the nasty gram or you can be like totally cool about it and be like hey I love that you love my photo however like this is how I make a living so unless you want to buy a license like you got to take it down so um, you, you don't just because cease and desist letters kind of have a, a mean connotation to them doesn't mean that you have to write it in a mean way so um, the next one is the DMCA takedown, which stands for Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This is something you could only do, only use, if your work was posted online and the infringement is also online. What you do in this situation is instead of dealing directly with the person who infringed your work, you deal with the company that hosts their website or if it's like a social media site you submit it to that site to say hey this was posted without permission um, and you tell them you know this is who i am i own this work here's the url to my website here's the url to where the work is being infringed you have to take it down and there's a couple other requirements. If you just look up DMCA requirements, you'll see them. Um, you have to like say like under penalty of perjury, I, I promise I'm telling the truth, things like that. Um, and then the website has to take it down because it's not their job to determine if infringements happen. It's the law says you have to comply. So when you see a, uh, let's say you're on YouTube, for example, and you see video not available due to copyrights mm -hmm. is 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 that typically a dmca that made them take that down probably i know youtube is owned by google or owned by the same company as google and i know yeah. they have like forms you can fill out um to report infringement so it can either be removed because of the music was in violation or it's someone posting you know mainstream tv shows and without permission things like that. So yep, that's what's most likely happened. So the downside of DMCA takedowns is it's really easy for the other side to get their work put back up because all they have to do is send a DMCA counter takedown notice that basically says, hey, I got your notice. I don't really know what's going on with this person. I, you know, I'm not violating their copyright, put it back up. Um, and it's not the website's job to decide if infringement has or has not occurred. That's, that's, they're not a court. So 
they they have to let it go back up. And if you want to keep fighting it, then you have to sue them. Um, the other issue with DMCA takedowns is it's based on a U.S. law. So if you're to worry, so if, if the infringement is happening on a website that's not based in the U.S., they're probably not going to care what the U.S. says about copyright. Um, they only care about what their country says about copyright. So if they get a DMCA takedown, they could ignore it and be like, we're not subject to U.S. law. Sorry. So... Or they probably wouldn't even say sorry. They just like we're not subject to U.S. law. We're you know deleted. Um, so there's that. Your fourth option: send a bill. Um, there are photo licensing companies that are notorious for doing this. They basically find suspected infringement, send you a bill that says with a letter that says you're using our client's photo by doing that you've agreed to the license uh, that they offer here's the license here's your bill pay it or we'll sue you um, i'm dealing with a client in a kind of in a situation like that where they used a photo without a license um, and actually they're asking for more than the licensing fee because the court allows them to do that so we're trying to negotiate that right now fun times and then the last, of course, your op, you can always sue for infringement. Um, suing for infringement gets complicated because people hear that, oh, you can sue and get $150,000. Like, yes, that is in the law, but certain things have to happen for you to be eligible for those higher damages. And if you haven't done your homework way in advance, you're probably not eligible for that. And you may not even be eligible to get your attorney's fees paid. So if you are somebody who wants to be in a position that you could sue when your work is in, is infringed and it's in and it's used by somebody who has the means to pay a high amount of damages, um, you got to have your ducks in a row in advance. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where you can sue and, but you'll never collect. So um, these are all situations you're going to have to work out in your mind ahead of time. Which options of recourse do I want to pursue when my work gets stolen and, you know, set yourself up accordingly. All right. So that's what I wanted to share about copyright. Um, of course, I'll answer questions about it at the end if you have anything additional to ask about this. But I want to jump into talking about photography contracts. Let's a sip of water. All right. So most of the time, to have a valid contract, you have to have three things. An offer, acceptance, and consideration. So offer and acceptance are pretty self-explanatory. Consideration is a legal term that means that there is a give and take between the parties that makes sense. So that could be um, photos for money if it's a paying client. If you are doing a TFP shoot with a model, it's photos for the model's time and talent. Um, this prevents people from being in a situation where you buy a house for a penny or pay a million dollars for a pencil unless there's something extraordinary about that pencil that makes it worth a million dollars so there's one exception there is one situation i'm going to talk about tonight that doesn't require consideration but most of the time most contracts require these big three and if you don't have them you don't have a contract so when it comes to photographers, these are the five most common contracts I see. This isn't an exhaustive list. There are other contracts you might need in your work, um, but trade for pictures, TFP, paid model, paying clients, second shooter for like events, and image licensing, which we talked a little bit about earlier. So. These are all situations where it's if you need these in your work, it's a good idea to have templates made in advance so that you are ready to go when these situations occur where you need them. So you're not scrambling. And 
something I always remind photographers about is you always, always, always want to have your contracts in writing. There is such a thing as a verbal contract and many times they're valid, but proving them is a pain in the butt. Um, because if somebody comes to me and says, hey, my client's not paying me, like what can I do to go after them? I start with, well, what does your contract say? And if they respond with, well, we didn't have one. Um, I can still work on that situation, but it just got a whole lot more complicated because I'm gonna have to piece together what were the terms of this contract based on things like emails and text messages and the actual behaviors of each side to figure out what was the agreement um, and then look to the law to fill in the gaps. So it may take me longer to piece together what the contract is um, it'll take me longer to do that than it would have to write that client a contract that they could have used to begin with to help them avoid this problem. So yeah, it's, it is worth it to, to invest in templates if your photography work requires it. So here's my approach to creating a custom contract. The best way I know to think about a contract is it is a relationship management document. Its purpose is to put everybody involved on the same page in terms of obligations and responsibilities, how you're going to deal with problems, what are the deliverables, things like that. So you have this master document you can go back to um, when there's a question about what you promised to do or if a problem occurs, the contract tells you here's how you deal with it. And it doesn't have to be in legalese. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be in microscopic print. Actually, would you please don't put your contracts in microscopic print. I don't like reading. I, I don't want to read those. Um, I have had to read those recently and it's like you're hurting my head. Um, and you can have it in plain, plain English. Um, your contract should be something that you and the people you work with can easily understand without needing a lawyer at your side to explain what it means. So that's my general approach. I also try to think about the lifespan of this relationship, you know, from the beginning, people meeting to the end of deliverables and what pitfalls might they encounter along the way and try to mitigate that um, or put in contingencies of if this happens, then this is, the, you know, if this occurs, then this is how we resolve it. So things like client doesn't pay, model no shows, things like that. Um, so that way, you know, because it's not if, but when problems occur and you want your contract to help you deal with them. So, all right. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the provisions I would expect to see in a photography contract. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but something if you're going to review your own contracts, things to look for. So scope of work. What are you being hired to create? Um, and this is in terms of like, what's the purpose of the shoot? How many images is the person going to get? What's the format they're going to get them in? things like that. So just a general of what are you making? What are you, you know, being asked to create? Scheduling and cancellations. It blows my mind when people no show on photographers, but it happens. Um, and for people who charge for your work, you may want to have act up to like three separate fees in your contract. You may have one fee for booking the appointment, which is basically but you are reserving your time. There may be a second fee for the shoot itself, which is for you actually picking up your camera and doing what you do. Um, and then there is a third fee for the final deliverables of the actual images. So it's okay if it's not just a one and done um, pricing situation. You could have multiple fees um, involved in working with you and that's okay. Um, and then if someone cancels, what are your rules? If they're allowed to reschedule, if they're a rescheduling fee, things like that. Payment, of course, very important. Got to get me out. Know, for those of you who do this professionally or semi-professionally, you want to get paid. Um, also want to deal with things like late payments. Um, if there's going to be interest charged. 
I recommend you set yourself up that the client doesn't get the deliverables until you get paid. So that way you always have leverage and it's like, okay, you want your photos, pay me. Don't pay me, no photos. Um, easy as that. So, because if you give them the photos and they don't wanna pay you, it's gonna be really hard for you to get money out of them later. So just saying. Um, yep, payment in full before deliverables, clear terms about deposits. So, cause yeah, it can be that they're reserving your time. And then if they no show, you can be like, okay, you can reschedule, but it's another scheduling deposit. And they're like, but I already paid you. It's like, yeah, you paid me to, to book my time on Wednesday. I, that prevented me from booking somebody else at that time. So yeah, you want to book me on Friday. Now you have to pay another deposit because you're reserving my time that could have gone to somebody else. So. This is a big one. You always want to specify in your contracts crystal clear who owns the copyright. Um, just so one, it's clear about who owns it. And because there's a good chance that your client, your subject, doesn't understand how copyrights work. I may be a copyright attorney, so I get it, but I bet a lot of models don't, or people who do senior portraits or things like that, they don't understand how copyright works. And they may think because they're in the photo, they have rights to it. So you wanna make it clear that just because somebody's paying you money, that doesn't mean they own the copyright. It being in the photo, you don't own the copyright to that. If, they, if you have a client who is going to purchase the copyright, they have to pay more because they're getting more from you um, versus someone who doesn't buy the copyright and they're only getting a license. So something to keep in mind as you're working with people. And this is something you may have to reiterate over and over and over again of you do not own the copyright. Um, if you don't own the copyright, you only have a license to use the images based on the permissions you gave them. So you may say, I'm doing your family photos and you can only do this for non-commercial, you can only use these for non-commercial purposes. So if your client happens to be like a realtor, suddenly the photo you took isn't gonna be showing up on their signs or their business cards. It's like, no, you want that, you pay more for that. Um, I took your family portrait so you can have pretty pictures to hang in your house or post on your Facebook or whatever. So you wanna be clear about that. Speaking of giving having someone purchase the copyright um, or if you're going to be giving the copyright to somebody that's called a copyright assignment of course in the law we have to have fancy words for everything so a copyright assignment means you are giving the copyright to another person you no longer own, own the copyright they do this is very important if you're going to do that it must be in writing and signed by the person who is giving up their copyright. If it's not in writing, you did not assign the copyright. I had this situation happen years ago. I was doing a photo shoot and the photographer said, oh yeah, like I'll, you know, you can have the copyright in all these images. And I said, that, thanks. That's great. That's very generous of you. Thank you. He sent me the photos and that's all he sent me. There was no assignment contained in that. So he still owns the copyright. I have an implied license to use these photos for whatever I want, but I don't own the copyright, he does. So, because it wasn't in writing. And I said, there was one situation where you don't have to have consideration for the contract, this is it. You can give a copyright assignment to somebody without consideration. You can just say, I'm giving this to you enjoy. They don't have to pay you. They don't have to do anything in exchange for it. So this is the one exception to the three requirements for a valid contract. It can be valid if you just write down on a piece of scratch paper, you know, I might assign the copyright in this work to Chuck. Sign, date, hand it over. You've assigned the copyright. It's now Chuck's. Mike doesn't have it anymore. So. Uh -huh, right. Mike. <laughs> so never gonna happen Chuck never gonna happen there you go so verbal assignments aren't valid you can do verbal assignments all day long they don't hold water 
Let me ask what, before you go on, let me just ask one other thing. Um, it seems like this, these are fairly um, fluid kinds of things. Are there templates or boilerplate that kind of cover most of these things? Or is it pretty much, um, you know, you have to kind of take each situation. Yeah, as you can comes. definitely create templates. And I know that there are some photography organizations that mm. make templates available. I can't vouch for any of them because I haven't reviewed them. Um, I, one thing I'm going to tell you toward the end of this talk is I created a course, an online course for professional photographers where because I'm a lawyer, there's rules that say I can't sell templates, but there's nothing that doesn't say that I can take my template and, and break it up into pieces and just show you over multiple slides. This is how I write it. If you want to take those and put them on your own document, I didn't do it. You created it yourself. Um, so, okay. so people ask me all the time, do you give or sell templates? And it's like, I can't because there's rules about lawyers doing templates. But I can give you all the I can give you all the pieces for you to do it yourself. But we as a club could potentially put together standard uh, like templates for sure. contracts and make them available yeah, to our. You may members. have to double check with the rules of your state, so make sure you're not engaging in the unauthorized practice of law. Um, but yeah, or if you want to have these are suggestions use them you know with yeah. the caveat of you know always have your own lawyer review them before you start using them for your photography business yeah again remember no legal advice being given tonight just information yeah um but yeah okay. there are groups i know there are photography organizations that do that so could you absolutely okay. yep all right, all right this one is huge if you are working with a model always, always, always have a model release. Um, because if you don't get a model release and the person is identifiable, you can have the photos. You can have, you own the copyright in the photo, but you can't use them professionally to make money to promote your work without their permission. And that means you have to go track them down. And if they refuse to sign, tough. Um, and I've seen that happen. Um, I saw it happen where the model, um, there was a falling out between the model and the photographer, the model didn't sign, and then the photographer actually died. And somebody else created a photo book and then was selling it of his work, got permission from the deceased person's family who now owns the copyright. The model found out about it hired me, I sent a demand letter to the person who put the book out saying, you used my client's image without permission. This is what he, this is what he's charging um, for the use. And the person's like, but I got permission from the family. It doesn't matter. I didn't know. Doesn't matter. I'm on a, I'm on a limited budget. Sorry. Like, I'm just the messenger. This is what my client's demanding. And the person had to pay. So always get a model release. Um, the only time you might not be able to get one um, that would make sense is if you are like doing ph ph photography of a celebrity. And so like if you're hired to do a celebrity's family photo, they want they don't want you to suddenly turn around and like be promoting your work um, as oh, this is the photographer who shot XYZ's family. Um, they don't want to suddenly be, you know, on your promotional materials. So I could see that being a reason to not do a model release. And I could also see that as a reason for them to purchase the copyright from you so they don't have to worry about it later. But other, but in normal circumstances, you want a model release. What if you're taking a shot of a model and you have the release, but in the background there are other people okay if they um, are identifiable people you might have a problem you may want to do some okay. editing you, you know use that photoshop and blur some faces or their faces yeah. <laughs> okay. um now here's something right. to keep in mind with these situations if someone's rights have been violated whether it's copyright or otherwise if they don't know or never, if they don't know or don't care about what you did, you're never going to get in trouble. So, something to keep in mind. But, you know, I'm a risk adverse lawyer. So, 
what if you're out in public? Because isn't it, aren't you able to take photos in public on public property and still yes. have identifiable people? So I, I'm referring to Mike's question. Like if you take a picture of a model, let's say in a park, uh -huh. and you see other people in the background, uh, as long as it's a public park, cor correct? They, you don't no. have to get a release for, oh. You, okay. If they are identifiable, they have rights. Oh. So, so if you're a street photographer and you're taking pictures of public streets <laughs> and you want to put those in a book, you'd have to find every single person. That is, I, or I mean, you, or you accept the risk that one or more of these people could come back and accuse you of using their image without permission. Um, it may come down to what is the applicable state law regarding these situations, because if it's not like a situation where like you're making posters and selling it, it's just like one of a thousand faces in a book, they may not have grounds really to go after you. I've seen that once where somebody said, you know, go after these people. They put like yearbook photos on a website and hers was like one of thousands. And the, the law, the, the law of the state that applied was like, yeah, like that's not not, that's not enough yeah. to get you there. But other states, it might. There also may be laws in your state regarding ph photographing children. So you want to be careful if if you're doing, if you're taking pictures at a playground, also you don't want to worry about not looking like a creep and having parents, you know, coming up to you. So right. versus like, hey, like this is my kid, I'm taking photos. Like I'm not a creep. Um, so <laughs> yeah. you got to be okay. careful about those things. But yeah, you got to mind your P's and Q's. Be careful with street photography. Um, also, you may want to have a provision in your contract about modification that reminds your client you can't you can't change my photos. You can't crop them. You can't add filters to them on Instagram. You know you have to use them as they are. If you want to make any changes, you got to get my permission. So I know photographers running to that all the time. Oh, dispute resolution. This is a big provision a lot of photographers forget to put in. This is how are you going to deal with problems when they occur. So some of the big ones, you know, mediation, arbitration, litigation. I recommend you pick one, not all three. I've seen it where it's all three and I'm like, what are you doing? You are dragging this out for like seven years with by doing all these things. Um, you want to state which state laws apply, usually yours. Uh, where you're going to resolve it, usually it's in your county, in your state, if there are any liquidated damages. So if they use your photos without permission, they've already agreed that they're going to have to pay you XYZ amount of money. I've seen that in some contracts, not always photography, but it is an option. Or if it's a client who paid you for services, you might put something in your contract that says the most money you'll ever get back from me is the amount of money you paid me for my photography services. And that, so if they only paid you 300 bucks, the most they can get out of you is 300 bucks. Um, and then in most contracts, I put in a provision that says the loser pays the winner's attorney's fees. So. All right, think, yep, I think this is the last one. This is, again, not an exhaustive list, but I'm throwing a lot of information at you. Another provision people often don't put in when they're writing their own contract is a provision that says all the terms of the agreement are in the contract. In a lawyer term, we would say it's within the four corners of the document. If it's not on the paper, it's not in the contract. So that prevents somebody from coming along and saying, oh, but we had that text message. No, doesn't matter. But you know, we during the shoot, we talked about X, Y, and Z. No, that doesn't modify the contract. Um, if it's not in the contract, it's not in the agreement. So that's something to consider looking for in your contracts. Um, usually in this provision is also where you might see all modifications must be in writing and signed by all parties. So that way it's how you can change it. But that way it prevents situations where, you know, you or your lawyer is tracking down emails and text messages and remembering conversations and was there a witness to that conversation to validate that that really happened, blah, blah, blah. And so, all right. And here's 
you know, and people are like, contracts are so complicated. I just want a handshake. I, you know, it's, I don't want to worry about it. It's a lot of work. I get that. Your contract is what's going to save you when things go sideways. So I know a lot of people are looking for like an easy template that they can just download off the internet. They're good to go. And if you never need to rely on the contract to save you, that's great. But if you are in a situation where everything has gone to hell and you want to go after your client because they've done something wrong, your contract is going to be what helps make that happen. So this is why it's important to have a well-written contract. It's not for when things go right. It's for when things go wrong. All right. So like I said before, I do, I did create a course because I realized that photographers need as much legal help as they, you know, as they can get. You're, not that you're not, you know, not that you're not bright, amazing people, but it's just, it's not in your wheelhouse. You're amazing at your craft. You're not amazing at law. Um, so I think right now the course is just under six hours. I created it in such a way that if I, that when the law change, if the law changes, I can make modifications and it doesn't car charge, doesn't cost you anything extra. So I called the course Lights, Camera, Lawsuit, The Legal Side of Professional Photography. I believe it's 23 lessons. Um, I think the usual price is 49 bucks, but I, I put on a promo co code of TREK2021 to get it for 1701. So, and I think that's, I made it only good through this weekend. So if anyone wants it, go for it. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact and you're like, I would have wanted that promo code, send me an email. I bet that I bet I have a promo code going on that's different than this, but I'd still give it to you if you ask for it. So, um, so this is where I give it, this is where I give it all away for nearly free. Um, and so things like my template information, forming your business properly, um, and then getting into other situations that we didn't talk about, like second shooter, um, things like that. So, yeah. So with that, what questions can I answer for you? And there's my email. Well, I, I have one. I have one question. Um, how do you prove that a photo is yours? In other words, the XF data with copyright is modifiable, at least in Photoshop and Lightroom. And if you scanned a, an old photo you took and whatnot, and I've seen cases where other people have it and all your JPEGs are identical. So how do you actually prove that a photo is, uh, is yours? So that's when I might go into um, the metadata for the photo to see if there's information in it about when the image was taken, what camera was used to take it, if there's anything that you've put in, into the metadata that identifies you as the photographer. Um, and so well, that way- the, the interesting part is when you scan uh, an old photo of yours, there is the, the metadata has nothing to do. It's the date you did that. So it's uh, so otherwise what you're saying is it would basically be metadata looking for clues, but it, it's difficult. It can be difficult. It depends on the situation, <laughs> what they're claiming, what you're claiming. It may get down to like looking at like, how, are they, is it a situation where they're just similar or it really is a situation where you copied from one you know, and put your name on it. So yeah, but that is something I would, but think that's one good thing about metadata is like, it does help determine when something was created um, or who created it. Hi Ruth, I'm an Hello. amateur photographer and I might in the future try to sell art through galleries. Sure. And I'm wondering how much of this is applicable to me? It depends. I'm saying that I'm saying that to buy myself some time to think. Um, no, so you're thinking about selling stuff in galleries. So you may want to think about: Does it make sense to to register your work, um, or you just may want to think about 
what is the criteria under which you would, you know, show stuff in galleries? Um, and if there's rules for that, there's gallery rules you need to be aware of so that as you're creating now, you can be mindful of um, what you want to do in the future. Um, if you're just showing um, or you're just going to be selling like, like a one-off, it may not be worth it to do a lot of things, um, but you may want to think about like when you have your work created, like prints created, do you need to have something on the back that identifies you as the photographer with a copyright notice? So that way, whoever the purchaser is, is reminded of who is the artist who owns the copyright. So it may not be an extended amount of things that you need to do, but you just kind of got to think about it in terms of like, what are the details of the situation and what do you need to do now? Um, or as you're preparing to show in a gallery so that your, things are less likely to go sideways in the future. Thanks. How expensive is it to register something? To register uh, through copyright.gov for an individual, like an individual owner, um, it's, I believe it's only $35 per work. If you are yeah. registering it as a business, it, or if you're registering a collection, it's $55. I recommend, if you are somebody who wants to learn how to do this, I recommend that you hire a lawyer for an hour to walk you through your first copyright registration so then you can do subsequent ones on your own. It's not rocket science, but it is a government website that is not the most user-friendly thing. Um, and I will tell you, when I did my first copyright registration, it was for my first book, and I, don't just have a law degree. I have a certificate in intellectual property. Like I know this stuff. It still took me an hour and several error messages to get my work submitted. So what I tell people, if you're going to try to do it yourself, you absolutely can give yourself an afternoon, like a quiet afternoon and have your preferred beverage waiting for you when you're done. Okay. That's the government for you. Yes. Hi, Ruth. I have a question. I actually put it in the chat. I was the photographer for one of the organizations I belong to, so I'm a member. One of the members decided they were going to do a history of the organization, and they got permission from the president of the organization to do that. The book has been published, and many of my pictures are in there. So I guess my question was, do I have any recourse? Because I was never asked permission to do that, but I was their photographer during the time. So, whereas was this a situation where this was your job? It was a, it was an elected position at the organization. Yes. And was part of your job to take photos? Yes. Oh. So that might be a situation. I'd have to, I'd honestly have to go like digging into like case law, um, because if I know if you are employed, and your job is to create photos then you are not the author of your work, the organization is, and they own the copyright in everything you create under the scope of your employment. In a volunteer position, I could see them saying, it doesn't matter if you're getting paid or not, but because this is a position you were hired to do, um, even though it's a volunteer position, um, that the organization may own the copyright in all of these photos. So that's a really good question that I have never been confronted with in my work as a lawyer um, in the last 10 years. So, um, but I could see that being a situation where you don't own the copyright in the photos you took while you were in that position for the organization. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, why don't we go through the chat and see what other questions were in there? Right. Okay. Let's see. Can the owner of a building like the Rock Hall have a copyright on an image of its building? I know that there is copyright available in architectural design. Um, I know that in certain circumstances, there was even a case, I believe, involving the Rock Hall where they were using like an image of the rock hall as a trademark. So it may not be a copyright issue. It might be a trademark issue. I know there's issues about taking photos of the Eiffel Tower at night when it's all lit up because 
there's rights to that. So most of the time you're probably fine, um, but you wanna be careful. You may wanna do a little bit of research um, just to dot I's cross T's. Um, but if there is a long standing history of people taking pictures of a building without getting sued, most likely you can probably do it too. Yeah. All right. We take lots of photos. Is copywriting expensive? Okay. You can do multiple, you can register the copyright of multiple photos at once as the collection if the collection actually is a collection. So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to do a collection of every photo I've taken or every photo I took in 20 and, you know, 2020. Um, but if it's like you worked an event, um, it's like, okay, all the photos from the event could be a collection. I helped a photographer register a collection where he took pictures of different types of cameras. Uh, so that would be a collection. Um, it's more complicated to do a collection. You have to, you want to go look at copyright.gov, look up the requirements because you have to have each image has to have a title. The, the collection has to have a title. You have to have a spreadsheet of all the photos and the file names. You have to upload the photos in that order. It's a pain in the ass. Um, there's limits to how many, how big of five of like a file groups you can upload at a time. Um, but it can be done. So um, yes, you can do that. How do you do analytics on Google? Google.com slash analytics. Um, oh, and then I would look up some YouTube tutorials because I'll admit I set up my analytics a long time ago. So I don't remember how to do it. Um, but I am sure there are plenty of tutorials out there who will tell you how it's done. Okay. That happened to me with YouTube and a French musician was using and still using my image. YouTube gave me 30 days to prove that I would be suing. Ew, that seems weird. Um, yeah. Dealing with Google legal is not, is not my favorite thing to do. Um, I don't know what to tell you because you should be able to assert your rights without proving that you're suing. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. I would have to look at the totality of the circumstances, what was filed, what they filed. Because um, it may be that you put in a DMCA and they came back with a counter notice and you have to sue at that point, which sucks, but that could be what happened. All right. Does email count as in writing for a contract? Does it have to be on paper? You, I don't recommend having email counting as the contract per se. I would have like a PDF and if they sign electronically through like DocuSign or something like that, that's legit. Um, I usually put in the contract that electronic signatures are as valid as signatures. So that way there's no one, they can't come back later and say, well, it wasn't pen and ink. So like, it's not valid. It's like, no, we put in the contract that it is valid. Um, in regards to email, if there is a situation where you have to give notice, I put in that sending an email can count as notice. So yeah. And then if it's, or if it's like a modification, I would still have it in a like, you know, create a document, PDF it, have them electronically sign it. Um, if they're not there physically that they could just sign it pen and ink. Um, so yeah, I, but in regards to paper, I have seen situations where photographers, when they come to shoots with a model, they bring two copies and just have the model sign twice. And then the photographer keeps a copy, the, the model keeps a copy. And so that's, that's legal. Um, I've done that a handful of times. All right. So when you do... Jump to the next one. It says when you do a copyright assignment, you lose your copyright rights. That's right. It's like, it's like when you sell your car, you don't own your car anymore. Somebody else owns it. That's the, that's 
what happens. Or if you choose to release your work to public domain, you can't get it back. Um, copyrights do expire um, for things that are created by individuals as the life of the author plus 70 years. So it's not happening anytime soon. Um, so you want to put in your will who gets your copyrights. Um, but yeah, no, if you assign the copyright, you don't own it anymore. Um, if you do assign the copyright to a client, to a customer, what you may want to put in is that they get the copyright, but you get a license back to use that photo for marketing purposes. So you can still keep a copy of the image in your portfolio or something mm -hmm. like that. So that's something I frequently see and write. Um, the ones it's, I think PSA has some templates online that, that was finished down below. So, yeah. All right. So the next one, I am a volunteer. I'll let you read it. All right. I think that's the question I already answered. No, ah. that's a different one. Okay. I'm a volunteer photographer for an outdoor museum and provide them with photos for their advertisements. I put my copyright on all their photos, but when they send my photos to various newspapers and magazines, I have to submit my photos without my copyright. Why do the magazines and newspapers require me to remove my copyright? They will usually give me photo credit. That's, pro that's probably a stylistic situation where they don't want the copyright notice on the image itself, they, but they will give you credit otherwise. Um, that could just be that that's how they want it to look and feel um, so that all the images in the magazine look the same in terms of where the copyright notice goes would be my guess. But you still own the copyright. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't have to put a copyright notice on your work to own the copyright. Mm -hmm. That's that's a given. Yeah. All right. When doing my volunteer photography for the outdoor museum, they want photos of crowds of people. Faces are visible in the crowds. Should I stop doing the crowd photos for this museum? So what I would expect the museum to have, and if they don't, they probably should, is that they have a notice that says, like, by walking into the museum, um, by walking into this area, you agree that, you know, you can be photographed and videotaped for any purpose without any additional permissions from you or something to that effect. Um, and so by entering that museum, you've given permission. Um, I also see these types of notices at things like street fairs and concerts, um, prof other professional like baseball games, um, the back of your ticket with the fine print, that's a contract, no one reads it but me. Um, and you are agreeing by coming into this area, by attending this event, you are agreeing that we can photograph you and use it for any purpose without any additional compensation to or permission from you. So if you go to the state fair and suddenly like you're on the poster for next year's fair of you like on the Ferris wheel, yee, um, you can do that. And around and probably at the entrance to the fair, they have that notice. And at least at the fair I've gone to, they have like A-frame signs um, periodically throughout the grounds that again, no one looked at but me. Um, that put people on notice that by coming in, we're ta we can do this and you've agreed. So I would expect for an event or an outdoor museum that they have that type of notice on the back of tickets, um, somewhere in the lobby or whatever the equivalent is for an outdoor museum that allows for that. Huh. Okay. Uh, do you need a model release for non-commercial use of an image, e.g. competitions that don't have prizes, even just hanging the photo on your own wall? Okay. If you're putting just putting the photo on your wall, like at home, no. If you're using it for anything else, you're using it for promotional purposes, so like in your portfolio, on your Instagram, whatever you need a model release, even if they didn't get paid for it, even if you're not selling it, if you're using it to promote yourself as a photographer, yes, you need to have a model release. What about entering something in a competition? So one of the local communities has a, uh, you know, 
a little thing where they do com, com, uh, competition and there are prizes. Um, yeah. You need a model release for that? Probably because you are promoting yourself as a photographer by participating. Okay. What about if you're attending a, an event that is put on by another organization where they hire the model and you are, you've paid a fee to be a part of that function as a photographer? Um, Question. It depends. <laughs> so it's a situation where it's an event, you, there's a model, you paid for the ability to photograph the model? Yes. I would suspect that somewhere in that fine print um, allows for that because that makes sense. Um, so any organization mind. that would spearhead that kind of thing, they would have done that ahead of time and had the model sign such a release. If, if they didn't, they should have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I've run into this at like open shoots where it's just like there's photog you know, photographers, models, and there is like one area where there might be like, like the official paid model um, that people like paid to have a slot, like a time slot with the model. But then there's another room where it's just open for anyone to model and anyone to shoot. Um, I really think there should be like a big poster on that wall that says, okay, if you come in here and you model, like you are agreeing to X, Y, and Z and photographers get A, B, and C. So that way there is, so I, so a photographer would just have to like take a picture of that, add to the file. Um, and that way it's like, okay, I know with this photo that, you know, at this event on this date, um, these people by voluntarily stepping in front of the camera, this is what they agreed to. I have a question. We have a community service program and our volunteer photographers who are members of our organization take pictures at nonprofit organizations events. Who owns the rights to those photos? And we give the photos um, to the organization at the end of it. Who owns the rights? It depends on what the contract says. So there is no contract. <laughs> of course there isn't. Okay, so I would hope at these events that there is that notice um, for if you are attending this event, you agree that you can be photographed. Um, I mean, if you're going to like a nonprofit gala or something like that, you know, there's going to be pictures. Um, and given that, you know, everybody carries a phone in their pocket now, like there's photos. But, um, but in terms of like the group using it for promotional purposes, um, I would expect there to be a notice, even though no one may, you know, they may not read it. They may be too, too carried away with, you know, oh, it's a party. We're excited. They don't read the release. Fine. They were still put on notice because it was there. Nothing's in writing. So there can't be a copyright assignment. So then that raises the question for me of who is the copyright owner? Is it the individual who took the photos or the organization that they were with? Um, and I would have to dig into that a little bit more to see um, where does it most likely come down. And this is a situation where you may have to have a judge be the ultimate decider of who's the copyright owner. Um, wow. but that would be the responsibility of the person that is contracting the organization to take the pictures, right? They would have had to have clarified that ahead of time. We don't have a contract through community service. People just, the organizations just contact us by email to request a photographer and then volunteer, people volunteer to do the event. Right, I'm just saying that the person who requests you guys to take pictures. They, have... they could or the, or the photographer could and say, okay, like I'll do this, but here's my contract. Or the, the organization who, who facilitates the group needs photographer, this group has photographers, they could have the contracts and say, this is, our, this is what you agree to if you have our volunteers. Um, so yeah, this is, this is when contracts are handy to clarify these things. Wow. Hmm. Can get messy, that's for sure. <clears throat> yeah. Can get messy, but again, it has to be in a situation where someone is willing to get upset enough that they fight over it. Right. Um, right. But to avoid that, it's better to have, because again, most people, you know, copyright is not a class you take in high school. Um, this isn't something that a lot of people understand. So it's better to clarify things and prevent problems than to have to deal with a mess 
um, if someone's complaining later. So to follow that up, if we have guidelines that kind of say that the photographer retains permission to use the photograph, does that cover us? And of course, we have to hope that the people read the guidelines that's sent to them, but there's no guarantee that they read it. There's no guarantee, but if you're, but if this, if the volunteer organization has like a website that says like, this is what we do, you could say like, hey, these are the rules. You know, this is our, you know, page that tells you these are the rules if you hire, if you use our organization to get a photographer for your event. And you could say, you know, the photographer retains copyright by giving you the images we're granting you a most likely perpetual worldwide paid in full royalty free irrevocable license to use it to promote your organization or your event and could sub license for that purpose only. And you could say you are required to post like here's a sample of a notice we recommend you post so that way everyone attending has given permission for their photo to be taken. This could be fun. <laughs> yes, I am a big I am a big legal dork who likes writing contracts. <laughs> All right, any other questions? I guess I yeah, I just I, I want to clarify something. Going back to the street photography thing that we were talking a little bit about earlier. You see all these videos on YouTube, Facebook, all the social media that um, somebody's taking a video or pictures out in public and especially let's say with cops with police officers um i i've always heard that if you're on public property you have the ability to record anybody that's in in that public property or if it's a public building you can record a public building uh from public property is so you're and what you're saying is that's not true well, you can do you being able to shoot or shoot video and being able to use it for commercial purposes are two different things. So just being able to shoot. Absolutely. You can do that um, okay. with cops. You there's rules about not interfering with them, you know, doing their sure, cop work. Um, so you got to be on you know, distance. Thank good. You know, just use the zoom lens. Um, so, yeah, if you want to do that. Um, there's no issue with that. How about um, how about posting it on a Facebook or a YouTube page as, then? As long as you're not running ads against it, I don't see why not. Oh, okay, all right. Because that way you're not you're not it's not commercial. You're just saying like, I saw this, or you know, I was at right. this protest, or. Yeah, I, I was thinking of one in in particular. I saw a video where a guy was taking video of the police station with police cars pulling in and out and officers came out and told him to stop recording and he says i don't have to i'm on public property i'm filming a, a public building it's not for profit i'm just they and of course they gave him a hard time why are you doing this he goes because i just want to it's my right to mm -hmm. and it, it and he posted it on youtube so i so he was right then. He can he can do that. Probably there was yeah okay. There may be a requirement in that state that if you needed to that you have to identify yourself so that you may be required to show ID. Um, so you may want to be prepared for that. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, as long as you're not otherwise violating the law and you're in public and you're not violating anybody's rights, you can do that. Actually, there was a reverse question um, recently where cause there are rules about like search, like when you have to have a search warrant and whatnot, like you have to get a warrant if you're going to GPS somebody's car. Um, oh. But um, there was a question of what if the cops put a camera in a public place just pointed at who they wanted to surveil and they just left it there and it just you know was sending back video feed do they need a do they need a warrant for that and wow. i don't think the law the law has not had to decide that question yet so. hasn't caught up yet to technology ruth, I have, ruth I, have, I have one quick question sure i'm i'm on vacation with my family and my wife um i want a picture of both of us i hand the camera to a passerby uh -huh. he takes our picture 
Um, <laughs> who owns the copyright? The passerby. Really? Yes. Yeah. It's it's yeah. who clicked the shutter. So it's not who owns the camera. That's what and that's that issue came up with the monkey selfie, the monkey that got the camera and took the selfie. Um, that automatically went to public domain because uh, copyright rights apply to humans, not animals. And so uh, the, a photo taken by a monkey, by a gorilla, go to public domain because no one owns that copyright. It is the person who clicks the shutter. Yeah, I, I heard that monkey lost in, in court on that yep. case. Yep. <laughs> I, same, I have, same idea. I have one more question about the street photography. So I guess I'm still a little bit confused because street photography is so prevalent, you know, and people take these images and and they're they're of strangers essentially, whatever. But then these images get put up in galleries, they get sold, they get put into books and get published and that kind of thing. So how does how does that all play out? There. Uh, it, it, it it's hard to, I guess I'm, I'm having a hard time trying to figure that out now because I'm, I'm a street photographer, mm -hmm. you know, or I try to be, you know, when, when I have the inclination. So um, I guess I'm a little bit confused about how all that plays out, you know, because it, it could be very definitely that I would take uh, an image sometime in the street and if I thought it was good enough and I wanted to put it in the gallery then I would certainly try and if mm -hmm. it, it then I would and if it would sell then I would sell the image sure if it's an identifiable person and your state law the applicable state law so the, the law of the state where you took the photo doesn't say otherwise I suspect there is a risk that that person could come after you for using their image without permission. So define an identifiable person. I guess I'm a little bit, you're not talking about someone famous. You're talking about any image where your image is recognizable to me. You are an identifiable person. Right. Somebody looking at that photo would be like, oh, that's Frank Jones. Um, you know, that's smelly Steve. I over um, kind of kind of throws a whole real inf that kind of throws a big snowball at the whole idea of street photography, yeah. uh, making it sound like it's illegal. Well, it depending. It depends, it depends. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, that there gotcha. could that they could come after you, but they would have to know and they would have to be willing to assert their rights and have it be worth it to assert those rights. Um, and a lot of times it's not or they're flattered. So they're happy about it. Um, or I, I know if something is like newsworthy and it is used for news reporting, then all that goes out the window and it's completely different rules apply. So if you were like a newspaper person taking photographs of newsworthy things, it doesn't matter um, if they're identifiable people. Uh, so because you have they're to, doing it as a journalist. Because they're doing it as a journalist. Understood. Okay. Thank you for your explanation. Sure. Yeah. These, these, the, this is why we need lawyers. If the law was black and white, we wouldn't need to have people explain stuff. And the answer to every question wouldn't be, it depends. One other question. Uh, uh, software will allow you to put a copyright on your picture. Uh, does that, is there any point in doing that? Sounds like you already have the copyright. What would be the purpose of adding a copyright notice? It puts, um, it puts everybody else on notice that it's yours. It's just a kind of a warning. But. Or, you know, it's letting people know this is who took the photo. So if you if you like the photo and you want to see more, go look this name up. Okay. But in terms of establishing your rights, it's not required. Okay. okay. All right. Any other questions? From the ACLU, in a public place legally present, I can photograph anything I see. Probably. Again, whether you can take the photo versus whether you can make money off the photo are two yeah. completely different things. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. This is very, very interesting. Yeah, and this is great. Thank you very much. Course. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you for having me. I look forward to being in Cleveland in person in late September. So 
if you happen to be out street photographing and you think you see me, you're seeing me. <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure you sign a release for, for us <laughs> if we take a photo of you. <laughs> I have, uh, a, I have done photo shoots in Cleveland, so I get it. Yeah, if, if you're here on a Friday, you feel like it, you're welcome to join yeah. one of our meetings. Come join us. All right, thank you. I appreciate Definitely. that. I would love to take your picture. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, yeah. Well, well, take care, and we'll see you all soon. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. Very good job. Appreciate My pleasure. Your, thank you. Appreciate you doing this. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.